on today's show, I welcome on a very, very special guest. He is Mike Procopio. He's the director of the Hoops Consultants. Mike, how are you doing today? Jeff, I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Um, you know, I want to ask you a question before we start talking about your career and how everything led up to what you're doing now with the Hoop Consultants, but how did you get started with the Hoop Consultants and how did you decide to start that? Um, well, I've had a little bit of a career in basketball. Um, it was like 2009, 2010. Um, uh, I was an assistant coach for the Maine Red Claws, uh, the Celtics, uh, at the time affiliate uh, D League team in Portland, Maine. And I wanted to do a little bit different things in basketball. Like the training thing was picking up. Uh, there's a lot of trainers out there. So a lot of people doing stuff on the physical side of players. And I wanted to do something more. You know, obviously I've had a consult. Uh, a player development background and coaching background. And I, I continue to do that, but I wanted to do something that could sort of provide information for players and coaches and especially coaches where um, coaches trying to get sort of from A to B. And a lot of coaches really don't know how to get there, especially young coaches. They, they, you know, they have an idea where they want to go, but getting there and having somebody who's already been through those experiences and building up their career a little bit, I thought that I could, give some insight, especially in the player development side, um, drill work, philosophy, how to deal with players, how to, how to deal with coaches. If you're a player, how to some you know, the really important things to work on and, and trying to streamline your, your career and your process to, to get to where you want to get to. So I felt as though I could give a good insight by, you know, giving workouts, um, getting clients to pay to get workouts, to get information, to have a sort of a, a somebody they could bounce things off of that already was at the professional level and had a career in doing what they want to do. So um, it was, it was pretty cool. I, I started, it was small. And then, you know, for the last 11 years or so, I had a, a job with the Dallas Mavericks as director of player development. I still worked in Chicago, working for Tim Grover, worked for Kobe. So I was doing all those, these other things as my main source of employment, but I always, I always sort of, carried the hoop consultants with me. And then now after leaving the Mavericks uh, about two years ago, I, I sort of ramped this up full time to, you know, webinars and workouts and clients and traveling to do clinics and things. So that's sort of the story behind it. That's, that's amazing. I, I love it. It's, it's a cool uh, concept. And I think it's, it's great that you're doing that. I mean, your career is absolutely just, just absolutely amazing. Like you were had some great, like career background and everything to have you as a hoop consultant give other coaches and players advice. I think that's just great that you can offer and lend your uh, expertise in those, in those fields. It's been a, yeah, it's been cool. Uh, it's been really enjoyable to be able to help people. I, I've always had a passion for it. So many, so many people took me under their wing when I was growing up and coaching. I started coaching. When I was 18 years old when I was a freshman at Suffolk university in Boston and I worked, I think the path that I took, um, I was an assistant coach for an AU team called the Boston Amateur Basketball Club. And I did that in the, in the spring and early summer. And then all summer, I would work 10, 11, 12 weeks of basketball camp in different places across the East Coast. And I, I met so many older coaches that took me under their wing to help me and, and give me advice and I really enjoyed that part of it and part of just sort of finding my way in this whole thing. And, and then when I got to a certain point where, you know, my career was going a little bit and, and I, I made a little bit of a name for myself, I always wanted to pay it forward with other young coaches and aspiring coaches that wanted to, to get somewhere into their career and try to, to help them like the coaches that helped me. I never forgot where I came from with that. And I think that's a really important mentorship is a really important part of getting better at anything, but especially coaching. And I think being a mentor is it's a special feeling to be able to help help as many people that want to be helped. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And I think that that's true. It's a pain it forward and you're doing, you're doing a, a great job of doing that pain it forward. I think that's the most important thing. I think that with coaching and basketball too, it's like the connections and, you know, having that mentorship and then, then be able to give that mentorship back is that's uh, that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, it's enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. So we, you talked a lot about how, like you, you just touched upon it a little bit about how you got started. Like 
becoming a stuff like like assistant how did like what made you want to get into basketball coaching and like what and work with the BABC as well too you know I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do Jeff to be honest with you I was a freshman at Suffolk just like any freshman I had no idea what I wanted to do yeah. I was an accounting major that switched over to business management um I always loved basketball I played it in high school I was not very good at it but always one of those guys that always wanted to play I kept score at this summer league, uh, outdoor summer league in, in, in Revere, Massachusetts is where I sort of grew up uh, from the age of seven on. And um, it was this great men's league that I, I, I kept score with years. And there was a referee. Uh, there's a referee that worked the camp that was affiliated with the BABC. And AU wasn't like what it is today. There wasn't very many teams. No one really knew what it was. There was it was just sort of this underground basketball uh, this basketball community of teams and, and the, the landscape of basketball back in the ni- 1990s was the best teams. There was only like probably 10% of the teams that there were back then that there are now, you know, the, it, it was very unpopular, but the best players played and like there was only a certain amount of small teams, you know, in, in, in Massachusetts. So, the best teams played AU in the summertime. They, they moved on to these national tournaments, the ones that are good enough to do so. And then all those influx of players that played AU but didn't qualify for these national tournaments went to basketball camp. So, and, and then they just sort of moved on. For me, I, I saw this team, I, I went to a basketball camp for years in, down in Cape Cod, and this team, the Boston Amateur Basketball Club, had all these Division One players on it they would scrimmage the all-stars from this camp once a week, like, you know, during the summer. And they had these huge names that, you know, obviously they didn't have the internet back then, but you just sort of saw and read about. And um, it was just this team, like, what, what is this team? I have no idea about it. it you know, this guy coached it named Leo Papil, um, who, you know, pulled up in a Cadillac and, you know, this Lincoln or Cadillac had had like eight players in it. And so it was like seven or eight guys that just came in. We had some pretty good players at the camp. We have Billy Curley who played for Boston College and went to the NBA. And, you know, we had a we had a you know really good local players that played in the you know camp that I thought were really good. Yeah. And then you saw these guys played against them. They beat them by about 40. Oh. And I was like, wow. So anyways, I was keeping score of this camp. You know, it was just a luck thing where the referee was wearing like a pair of shorts or something that had BABC's name on. I'm like, where'd you get that shirt or shorts or whatnot? And he goes, well, I sort of affiliated with the team. I'm like, really? And um, he goes, yeah, I, what do you know about them? We started talking. I was like, I'd love to keep score or work for him or do whatever. And he's like, yeah, I'll get you hooked up with the guy. So I started with him a little bit. And, and then also I was a manager at Suffolk. So I was, I was like, I sort of liked the whole coaching aspect of, of, of basketball. And I didn't really know much about it. I didn't really, <clears throat> I didn't know how to so, sort of move up in it, but I was a manager. I helped out at my high school and there was an assistant coach named Tim Collins, who's a, who's an athletic director, in, in, you know, in the Boston area, at Natick high school, I believe, but he was an assistant, a grad assistant. And he was telling me about how, working all these camps will really help you, you know, in your career. So, you know, I heard about the Red Owlback basketball camp, the Dave Cowens basketball school. I knew the camp that I would go to down in Cape Cod, but I didn't know about a bunch of these other ones. So yeah. he goes, no, I think you need to work all these camps. So um, I was like, all right, great. And so he got me into a few. I called a bunch, like in the Boston papers, you know, especially in the springtime, there would always be these advertisements once a week about all the basketball camps that were going on. And I would just, I just called a bunch of people and uh, I got connected. I, I probably worked about 10 straight weeks of camp. So like the camp schedule would be like, you start on Sunday, you finish on Friday, go home, sat, you know, Friday night, Saturday, and then go back Sunday morning, wherever, you know, whatever camp you were going to go to. So I ended up working a, a, a sort of a, a schedule of 10 in a row, uh, mostly in the, in the Massachusetts area, one, uh, particularly, I worked uh, in New Hampshire called Phillips Exeter, where I met a bunch of great people, Mike Lunny and Keith Frail and, and Jerry Frail, who, who was a head coach at UNH for a long time, was a Hall of Fame coach. 
Um, so, but I worked like the Red Auerbach, the Dave Cowens. I went to um, a camp called the Eastern Invitational Basketball Camp, where it was like more of a recruiting, a, a basketball recruiting camp, like a showcase camp. Uh, the Pocono Mountains, I would go and, and just sort of all Boston College, Providence. I mean, you, know, you name it, I tried to work the camp. So on uh, the camp circuit. So just coach kids and sort of learn. And the biggest thing about coaching was like, not only the coaches that you worked with, but at night, usually every night, there'd be a lounge area set up where they'd buy the coaches pizza and, and, so, and, and sodas and beer and stuff. And then coaches would just talk shop and and sort of that's where you would learn. You would just have a notebook with you. You would just sort of take down as many notes as you can, have conversation with coaches and uh, sort of learn. And, and, and not only that, just coach at the camp and just sort of learn by coaching kids in drill stations and and games and things. It was pretty cool. It, it was for me, it was the best way. It was the best way to get better at coaching because you had all these you know, experienced coaches trying to help you out and spend time with you. It was it was pretty cool. That's so cool. That's like, that's, that's a like great experience. And like, who's like any of the coaches like that, like who was one of the coolest coaches that you sat down with in that lounge area, with the, like the pizza and stuff like that, like really helped you. You know, there was so many coaches like Dave Hopla, who's a, a world renowned shooting instructor. I met at that camp down the Cape Cod. Yeah. And he, 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 le- he would lecture. Like he was the first guy I ever, ever sort of, saw that would he was an unbelievable shooter like the, one of the best shooters in the world you can get him on youtube and things he's he's phenomenal and dave would go from camp to camp to camp and remember i didn't know anything about this camp circuit or in basketball in general i would just watch basketball and play it and shoot around so i had no idea about the whole inner workings well dave would go probably speak at about 200 250 camps in the summer so he'd go Monday to, you know, he'd do like two or three camps a day. He'd, he'd go, you know, go lecture, driving his car to another camp, driving his car to another camp. Wow. So he would spend the night sometimes at the camps that I would be at. And we would talk about shooting and coaching and basketball in general. And then there'd just be a lot of just, just normal everyday coaches from all across the East coast that sort of took you down and sort of, and sort of mentored you and, and talked about basketball and, I just got a great chance. There was a guy named, um, you know, there was, let's see, um, Ricky Boyages, who was an assistant coach at Boston College um, in the 90s and moved on to Ohio State and some head coach at William & Mary. And now he works for the Big Ten and, and, uh, with the um, supervisor of officials. He, you know, he took me under his wing, just talked X's and O's and talked different things. I didn't know what I wanted to do in coaching, like yeah. what sort of, what area of coaching and expertise that I wanted. And there was just all these coaches. Like I go to the Pocono mountains and they'd have this camp called the Pocono invitational. And there'd be, again, there'd be a group of 30 coaches, 35 coaches that, you know, you bust your ass during the day. And then at night you're just kicking back and talking and talking hoop and division three coaches and high school coaches and, um, and mostly division three coaches and high school coaches. That's sort of the, the people that I would probably rub elbows with the most. And um, it was just great. And awesome. it was just a great, it was great experience to be able to, you know, sort of just share stories and, you know, how they did things and you pick different things up and you wrote and you took notes down. And that was my first year in it. And then I just started doing it every summer. Like I would do probably three or four, summers in a row where I would do 10 or 11 weeks. I didn't travel. The boss, the BABC went to Vegas and these other uh, national events. I was like 19, 18, 19 years old. So I wasn't going to do that. And they didn't have the budget for it. So I, I would, when they would travel in the summer, I would start my circuit of camps probably like late June and then all the way through, you know, Michael Hart, Mike Hart was another guy that, you know, obviously you had on your show that, you know, he took me under his wing and talked to me about things. I mean, he had a, you know, he built up St. Andrew's school into a, one of the better prep schools in New England. And he, he took, you know, he took the time to sort of talk to me about what he did and how he did it. You know, some of the development things that he did with his kids, he was big into X's and O's. He's, he's a big character like that. You know, as far as like socially, just yeah. a great guy and, you know, always get guys laughing, but it was sort of that brotherhood of, you know, sort of working in camp, you know, it, it was great where you worked at camp with somebody in June and then four or five weeks later, you're in like Maine in, you know, at Colby College. And then somebody like, again, 
you didn't really keep in touch like that. And then you saw them at like the, you know, yeah. the first day or two at camp. And you're like, oh, wow, wait a minute. I just worked with you five weeks. So that's great. And then you just keep carrying on these conversations. And, you know, it, it sort of taught me a lot about the game. I, at that point, I didn't know if I wanted to be an assistant coach or a head high school coach or a college coach. But I sort of learned quickly that I, I wanted to get more into the developmental side. So I started streamlining my summers into working events or working camps or working with players in the more of the player development fashion and sort of streamlining their development rather than X's and O's and things. But I always work, I probably worked camp for a good 10 years. And then finally sort of probably when I worked as a scout with the Boston Celtics, I probably stopped working a steady diet of 10, 11, 12 weeks of camp. Oh, wow. That's, that's crazy. And, and like, what was it like to like get to make that decision get into player development? I feel like I feel like player development now. I don't know if maybe it's because of social media, but I feel like I see a ton of people trying to get into the player development world and everything like that. What was it like to to like you know get into that world and like who are the people that you spoke with and kind of helped you like really make that decision to get into that? Right. So, yeah. So a, a dream of mine uh, from watching hoop dreams and, and and things like that. There was yeah. a camp called the Nike ABCD camp and uh, run by a guy named Sonny Vaccaro at the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was this all-star camp. It was humble. It was a great, you know, I, I never, I didn't know anything about it. I was more sort of curious of what it was. I remember working a camp with Billy Curley's brother, Mickey Curley, who played at Boston College and was a really good high school player for Duxbury and went to Boston College and had a little bit of a professional career. Well, at the, in the summer, he was still in high school and um, we were about the same age, give or take, and he had this ABCD shirt with like number, I don't know, 216 on it or something. I'm like, what's that camp? And he was like, well, you know, they, they invite the top players in the country and, you know, we come in and we play and, and we have these classes we have to take. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So my first couple of years in working with the BABC and things like we sent some of our guys to the Nike All-American camp and they sort of split from Nike. Nike ABCD camp went to Adidas ABCD camp and then the Nike All American camp sort of followed the same script. Invite about a hundred of the best players in the country, 120 of the best players in the country. Wow. Uh, let them play, let them drill, play in front of college coaches, and then take these classes. So these academic betterment classes, you know, throughout the week. So I always wanted to work camp, and I got somebody gave me a phone number for George Ravlin, who George is one of the you know Hall of Fame coach. He coached at USC, Iowa, Washington State. But he was a big Nike executive. He just got out of coaching. was a big Nike exec. And he was the one who was running this camp. So I would go. I, I called him up and, you know, I told him who I was with. And he goes, yeah, you could definitely work. At, you know, give me your information. And he sent me out, you know, this packet of information about the camp. And, you know, 500 bucks flight. It was in Indiana. So 500 bucks. They paid for your flight, gave you a bunch of gear. So you go to this camp and, like, Future NBA players, you know, I mean, it, Baron Day. I mean, the, the names of the camp were ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, McDonald's All Americans, future NBA guys. And so I go to this camp. And again, I was coaching at the camp, but they did this thing where they had these college players came in and work the camp, but also worked out with instructors. And again, Back then, there were no real individual instru instructors. Guys just played. And then yeah, if they yeah. worked out on their game, they either went to the park by themselves or went to the gym by themselves. They might have had a high school coach that worked them out. But there wasn't really this whole, like, big, you know, other sort of shadow government of workout guys and trainers. It had not – there was nothing like that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I would do this camp – you know, work the camp and then the kids would have a couple of hours off to go to these classes as high school kids. So in the gym one day, I just stumbled upon these workouts. Well, you had Vince Carter, you had Tim Duncan, you had like, they were all in college at the time yeah. and they were doing, they were doing these workout sessions where they were individual drills. And so they had what, like maybe 30 of these kids working out with all these other coaches. And most of them were, had NBA shirts on like, Cleveland Cavaliers, Golden State Warriors, these instruct these coaches. And they would work these guys out and they would do all these drills I never really saw before. And I I, I would just watch in, in, in the teaching that went on. Well, I'm like, this is, I, I gotta get into this. This is this is more my style of 
taking players, getting them better, putting them in game situations, working with them on the court individually, and then put them in game situations and game simulation. So from that, I asked if I could sort of switch over to the other side of the camp instead of, you know, not this that year, but obviously in the future. Well, yeah. there was this guy named Herb Livesey who ran – like was in charge of the college council was in the college council workouts. He ran a camp named called snow Valley out in Santa Barbara, California. And it was besides five star. And it was probably a better teaching camp than five star, not a better camp, but a better teaching camp. They had all these coaches from all over the country that come in and these kids, like usually camp, you play three or four games a day. You had fun, you played knockout and all that stuff. Well, they didn't do that. That, that camp was more structured for teaching. So I asked him, I said, can I, you know, is it okay if I come out and work your camp? And he goes, yeah. And, you know, I watched him lecture and I, I, I watched him work and he took me under his wing as a, as sort of a mentor to teach me how to get players better, how to talk to players, the drills you do, the teaching points that you use. And he was a really old school coach. He's about, he's about 82 years old now. Um, he still scouts in the NBA. He, he's a longtime scout, longtime high school and college coach. But he he took me under his wing like year in and year out. He was you know, he was working in the minor leagues and then he went to the Portland Trailblazers. But he would always do things like we would always have a back and forth email back and forth about workouts and teaching and and, and whatnot. And then he would also educate me on the on the scouting side and the, and sort of, you know, the scouting and the player evaluation side in basketball, yeah. as well as the teaching side. And I sort of combined the two of how to evaluate players, what skills that they needed to get better at to be high level players at their level, you know, if it was high school or college or professional. Yeah. And that really helped me as far as the, you know, the teaching side of not only the development side, but the player evaluation side. And Herb was, you know, a big influential part in my life. And he, he also, another gentleman who worked at camp uh, was named Tate's Locke. Well, Tate's was uh, Bobby Knight worked for Tate's at army. And, you know, he went from army to, you know, army to Miami of Ohio to head coach at Clemson. And, you know, he had this huge career in basketball that he worked at all these places and all these, you know, he was just a great teacher of the game. So I, you know, I, I stayed in contact with him and he's still a close friend of mine today. Same thing in, in his eighties, he was scouted in the NBA. And again, guys like that having bookends of two that really taught you player development and, and sort of how to work with players and teach. So I was in love with player development probably after my second or third year sort of working camp. Like I was like any other coach, like, you know, I wanted to like memorize these plays and X's and O's and maybe I'd be a high school coach. I never really had huge aspirations of coaching in Kentucky or anything. Yeah. I just wanted to be a, a call. I just want to be a, a basketball coach. Yeah. But then that switch from, all right, like team coaching to individual coaching, it really took a, a sort of a turn for itself. And the gentleman that I worked with named Leo Papil, he was – Again, he was a basketball lifer, um, worked for Rick Pitino at Boston University um, when, when, Rick, when Rick was starting his career. And then Leo, you know, was an assistant coach at Cleveland State. He worked at Suffolk University as well, but he worked at Cleveland State when they were really good. And um, then he ran his team. I think he's run his team for over 40 years now. And but like so he was he, he was sort of really ingrained in this basketball, had one of the best teams in the country. Um now there's like tournaments everywhere nationwide, but back then, especially in July, there weren't that many tournaments. So Vegas, which everybody knows about being a hotbed of like tournaments throughout the summer, there was only really one tournament in Vegas. It was called the LVI, the Las Vegas Invitational. And they had about 64 of the best teams in the country. Guys like, you know, I mean, every player you name, every big time team would send that would be invited to this tournament and was sponsored by Nike. Well, Leo's team, again, these kids from Boston, you never really heard about. Well, you heard about it if you knew, but like, yeah, Boston wasn't really a hotbed of talent. Yeah, they didn't yeah, have, yeah. Yeah. They didn't have a lot of individual, like 12, like great McDonald's, McDonald's yeah. American players. They would have two or three really good players. Yeah. But they would all yeah. do just these tough, these Boston tough kids. And 
then they end, you know, he Leo would win the tournament every year. I think he won it like three out of four years or two out of th- three out of four years, I believe. Wow. And like uh, he had this great team. Well, when Rick Pitino came to the Celtics, he hired Leo as his head scout. So at the time, I didn't know much about the NBA besides obviously watching it and reading the newspaper about it. Well, when Leo got the head scouting job, he sort of brought me around the NBA a little bit and sort of taught me about it. And I had access to some things like Rick Pitino's pre-draft workouts that he did his first summer were done at Suffolk University. They used to do it at a, a bigger place that was wasn't really locked down like Fort Knox and too many people were going in and out. He wanted a sort of a secret place to work guys out. Well, Suffolk was re- located right up the street from the Celtics offices at the time in Boston, yeah, right yeah. in the heart of it. And Suffolk had this like basement gym that no one really knew about. It, you know, it was a real small gym and he would bring like Keith Van Horn and David Wesley and all these, you know, all these Celtic players or players they were evaluating for the draft and, you know, I, so I got on the gym. I was allowed to go and watch the workout. So, you know, it was a pretty cool thing. Well, when, when NBA players would come in in the summer and maybe no one was around, Leo would ask me to work them out, like Bruce Bowen. Uh, Bruce Bowen was the one guy I worked with when he joined, when he was with the Celtics early on in his career yeah. and being able to work him out. But um, Leo sort of got me into the NBA, sort of got me around it. I didn't work, I didn't work for the Celtics until Patino left. I think I started in like 2003 and um, it was a pretty cool experience just to be around that NBA aspect of it. So, yeah. And then that's sort of what got me into working out, you know, better players, pro players. I worked out college guys. I would go to like every day I would like in the morning, maybe I'd go to Boston college and work their players out. I then would work out some local guys, some maybe guys are playing overseas or not. And then I would drive down to Providence at night and work out players at Providence and then come home late at night. So wow. my schedule, and again, wasn't getting paid for it. Like they, it was illegal for college teams to pay you to work their players out in the summer. So what I would do is I would work their guys out and then they would have me speak at camp. And then, you know, they would usually take care of me on a, on a speaking fee, but you know, mostly I wanted to do, you know, work out guys at BC Providence, BU Northeastern to, to really get better at, you know, being this young kid working out college players to be able to have presence on the floor. And and that's one thing that I think, I think that young people that are working in basketball now that are trainers or working in player development, like having presence, it's not the drills that you do, but having the presence of a having them believe that, you know, what you're doing, but B knowing your craft inside and out to be able to correct. And I think like, to me, players getting repetitions, but you being able to correct them is more important than some elaborate drill that you do that looks really good. And, you know, and you're not really able to teach. Yeah. I think the teaching aspect of the game is, is something that, you know, and actually making corrections and knowing what you're doing. I think that's sort of a lost art form in in the player development realm today. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, it's crazy. I think teaching is the biggest thing, even in coaching as well. And then the player development, I actually just had this conversation with, um, coach Tom Newell about teaching how big it, how important it is to be as a coach, to be able to be, you could be a player, but you have to learn how to teach in the aspect. If you want to get into the coaching aspect. I think that's the biggest, the biggest yeah. thing ever. Yeah. I think you have to learn how to, I think that's another thing that people don't realize you have to learn to be a teacher as well too. An instructor, you, you might be able to do it, but you can't, you might not be able to show it or teach how to do it. Yeah. Like for me, I was a, t- I was a terrible player. Mm-hmm. So like, it was funny. I was working out with this kid named Sean Conley. Sean was a local legend in, in, in the North Shore, Massachusetts, um, was one of the leading scorers, like career wise in, in, in Massachusetts for high school, uh, went to Providence, transferred to Ohio State. So I brought him to Suffolk to work out. I was probably like, you know, I was probably my senior year at Suffolk. Yeah. And I was working out Sean and, and I was trying to instruct, some, I, I mean, demonstrate something. I wasn't a huge demonstrate guy, but I just wanted to get the footwork down or, or on some shot. Yeah. And I like literally hit the side of the backboard or some or brick, like ridiculous. Well, I had a kid that went to played at Suffolk. It was an older kid. Went, it was from, um, from Lisbon and he was a character and he goes, Mike, after the workout, we were done. And he goes, Mike, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you some advice. 
never demonstrate another drill ever again. And I was like, you know what? You, 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 you're pretty much right on that. You know, uh, I'd never demonstrated ever again after that. But my thing was the teaching part and correcting part, like watching film, watching how to do it, watching so many games. And you didn't have YouTube back then. So anything you can get your hands on to try to like watch and study and, and, and things like that. Um, I think the, the, again, the teaching aspect and, and learning from guys like Herb and Tate's lock. And there was a guy named Dave Severns who, um, who worked in the NBA forever, but he's another guy that I sort of gravitated to, to, we would always go back and forth and talking about teaching and things like that. But I think obviously knowing your craft is important, knowing how to teach, but also knowing how to correct and, mm-hmm. That's the biggest thing. Like for me, my workouts are mostly boring. They're intense, but they're boring. They're doing the same things over and over and over again, but having your eyes on the player at all times to be able to correct them on the spot, to be able to, you know, give them a 30 set, 20, 30 second sound bite of what they did wrong, what they need to do to fix it and then move them on is really important. So I think if you're trying to get into player development, I think it's so overrated to be a player or someone who is a good player but I, I, you, but you do need to be able to teach it and know what you're talking about. And if you, so usually if you're a player that's trying to get into player development, you're a little rough around the edges as far as the teaching part. Like a lot of players don't know why they were good. They were just good. A lot of them were physically naturally good, or they just had a good knack for it um, through osmosis of a coach to work with them through their skill development, but then actually translating that into teaching it it's a different world like for play a lot of players who played, not yeah, everybody. Yeah. I don't want to put the whole group in there, but, and then for player people who didn't play, like they're usually a bit, little bit more technically sound with their teaching. But the problem is they don't understand players and they don't, that they, they'll talk to them for 10 minutes or five minutes on a correction, not 10 minutes, a long time, yeah. but three minutes on a correction, four minutes on a correction. And you know, people's attention spans, especially players, attention span, young players, they'll tune them out in two seconds. So there's a plus minus to not only playing, there's a plus for that, but there's also a minus for it. There's also, if you didn't play and you came through video or, or however you came into coaching, there's a plus for it because again, you didn't play, you probably weren't that good of a player and had that aspect to it, Yeah. but you probably paid attention more, yeah. but you forgot about the presence of players and how to communicate to them. And then like not, not having good presence or players tuning you out. So you have to have that sort of, I think that sort of balance of, you know, the playing background is important, but more of like knowing what play, like how people and players tick and obviously knowing your craft to be able to correct it and combine the two, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like understanding people and understanding like how it would work. Like I think you have to understand the players. And like you said, people don't have the longest attention spans, especially now with like social media, there's like, Oh, no, it's, 10, it's 10, 15 second videos so now yeah. and everything like everyone's attention spans are not is what it used to be but yeah that's absolutely correct and i think the doing the 30 second thing is great because you're still moving through the drill and they get the get your message across yes that's that's great so what was it like to working with the Celtics? you were a scout we started out as a scout with them what was it like did you report to danny Ainge at all too <laughs> yeah so so here's my deal with it so my guy leo papier was a head scout they had mm-hmm. another guy named chris wallace who was a general manager i sort of bumped into chris from time to time yeah um when he was you know in, in different basketball avenues and chris is a ment a long time mentor of mine so the celtics got sold to the new ownership group that owns them today wick grossbeck and c pack luca and their big team of people so they had a transition they were going through. They just ended with Rick Pitino. They made the Eastern Conference Finals. And so they made that run. I was around the team a little bit, but not very much. They had me work out players for them that they that the coaching staff sort of didn't want to work with during the season if they signed a guy or whatever. Um, so I was sort of around them and had a, you know, sort of had friendships with a lot of the staff. Well, um, when they went through this transition, they they made, right before they did the sale, they traded for Vin Baker. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, right, yeah. so they needed somebody to sort of not to keep an eye on, but just sort of be in the house with Vin, right? Yeah. So they had me, they hired me to live with Vin Baker. So <laughs> like they couldn't hire me officially because the team got sold, 
But usually when you sell a team in the NBA, like it takes months for that new people to take over. Yeah. And in between the sale and the new people officially taking over, like there's usually a hiring freeze. So they couldn't really pay or they couldn't hire new people, especially in front office positions. So um, they said, hey, Mike, we'll pay you like 300 a week. You come in, you're going to live with Vin and you'll talk to him and stuff. And while when he goes to practice, we want you to come in and we want you to like break down these this film. Again, not scouting more, more so, more making these scouting tapes of – these European players because like the European thing was starting to get big with the, with scouting and, and, and players coming over. Yep. So they wanted somebody to break down film and, and get information about European players. So that first year that I worked like Darko Mill, that was a Darko Milicic draft. So there was, yep. a, there was like four or five players that were probably going to go in the first round at that time was unprecedented with European players. So it was more of an education of, how to, you know, how to make film, how to, how to break down film, how to order film, you know, and, and make these scouting tapes. Some were good, some weren't. Chris Wallace would teach me all the ropes about that. And then we would talk about evaluation. We would, you know, go to local games to scout. He would, and I would just drive them and go with them. And he would talk to me about how these teams are run, how, how to evaluate the mistakes that he made and the pluses and minuses he made throughout his career at that time, you know, get leading into it. So it was more of an, a, a paid inter- internship to, for me. So like I did the VIN thing for a few months and then I moved out of his house. Um, and then I, I sort of start once the new ownership took over, they hired me officially. So I would just, again, carry on that European thing where I would just break down these international guys and, get in as much intel as possible and then and then talk to anybody that we want to talk about how to get better at evaluating players so it was pretty cool my first couple you know and then Danny Ainge took over that year yeah, so like yeah. Danny took over during the playoffs so I didn't know Danny at all and you know I, I, I just said hello I didn't know if I was going to have a job you know usually in those things when a new guy takes over they usually fire everybody yes. but I yeah, I was sort of new to it. So I had no idea about how it worked. So Danny sort of took me under his wing, man. We, we became really close. And, you know, as far as like just being able to go back and forth, he thought I was a funny guy. Yeah. I had a lot of good sort of intel in basketball just because like I would work the Nike All-American camp in the summer. I'd work out these college guys. I'd work the Michael Jordan flight school in the summer where like Michael ran this camp for kids. But then it would bring in all these big time college and high school kids to work his camp. And then they would play at night with him yeah. in front of the whole camp. Yeah. So I would like work out those guys and they would be draft prospects. So like, and, and again, it was hard to get into those camps. And I, and I already had that foundation from doing it for a few years before I even joined the Celtics. So like that was sort of my deal with him in the sense that like, I didn't know a lot. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. no worries. I, I didn't know a lot about, um, I didn't know a lot about, like scouting or or anything but i was always around really good players in the summertime so yeah. like so i would do my european thing i would you know i would go around hang around danny and you know danny would give me some assignments and i would get him information or do some things so danny just sort of took me under his wing again how the nba was run and that's what i needed to learn um it was a pretty interesting deal when i was at the celtics after my first year I told you about Dave Hopper, the shooting coach. Well, he ran these like college shooting camps in the summertime. You know, he would have, you know, come in on Friday, leave on Sunday, just have all these college kids come in. Uh, They do two sessions a day, learn how to shoot and then do all these drills during the day. Well, we did. He did one in Chicago and one in Philly. And we did one in Chicago at Tim Grover's gym. And Tim at the time was working on all these NBA players. Michael just ended his career in Washington. So he was working on all these NBA players. So we did his, we did these, this camp in his, uh, in his place in August. And during that time, Antoine Walker had a charity game in Chicago at the United center. And he had all these NBA players coming to Chicago. They would party it up, but they would do this charity game, yeah. you know, have 10,000, eight, 10,000 people come to the game. So in between sessions on like a Saturday, I always wanted to work for Tim Grover. Again, this training thing never really took off anywhere. It, it was like sort of like 
an underground thing. So he would have all these NBA players come into Chicago to work with him. And I, I thought that was the most like unbelievable thing to read about. So I, I wanted to be a part of it more than I wanted to be with the Celtics or anywhere else. Yeah. So like Tim would never give me the time of day. Um, again, I just finished my first year with the Celtics. I knew Paul Pierce a little bit. Yeah. And so Paul came in for the charity game. And in between sessions, we have like a two hour window where we would just get lunch and come back. So I was walking out of Grover's gym. Pierce was walking into Grover's gym and he was like, Hey Mike, can I get a workout in? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to lunch, but I'll come back and I'll come back early and work you out. Is that okay? He goes, yeah, I'm going to lift with Tim Grover. Like Tim was more of a fit a strength and conditioning guy than he was the basketball guy. Yeah. yeah. But, but you know, he, they had no one really to work the players out. So I'm like, yeah, let me get out of lunch and I'll come back and I'll, and I'll, and I'll get your workout in. So I did that. I, you know, went lunch, came back, he came down, got, got shots up and worked out on the floor. And Tim Grover was right there watching. And, you know, I put him through like an hour workout. And he goes, my, you know, and he came up to me, he finally knew my name. I, I had no idea. I don't even think he knew my name actually. <laughs> he came up, we talked and he goes, how would you like to work for me? And, I literally had to do a double take because that was sort of in my mind. I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to come to Chicago, impress Tim and then work for Tim. So Tim would, you know, Tim came and, and said, yeah, I'd like for you to work with me. I said, well, I got to work for the Celtics. That's my job of employment. Are you talking about year round? He goes, no, I, what I do is a year round. It's like three months. It's like in the sun. It's like, it's like July 1st to October 1st. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, Hey, look, I'd love to do this maybe we can do something where I'd work for the Celtics for nine months and I worked for you for three months. And he goes, yeah, that would work. So when I went back to the Celtics, um, you know, after that weekend, you know, I, I talked to Danny about it and Danny was like, yeah, that'd be an unbelievable idea. You could work with all these like NBA guys that we might be able to sign in us, you know, and it, it, you know, it might help down the line to have relationships with these NBA guys. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I mean, that, that really makes sense. And um, so, yeah, that's that's sort of in my first year of living with Vin Baker, learning from Chris Wallace, learning from Danny when he took over. And then the Grover thing, it sort of started my career up a little bit where I was learning how to scout. But during the summertime, I'd work out all these NBA players like Jawan Howard, Michael Finley, Dwayne Wade, uh, Sean Livingston, you know, and uh, like, again, uh, these guys, these all these NBA players, Bobby Simmons, there's a lot of, you know, Tony Allen, Delonte West. Like, we had so many great players come through the gym and to be able to uh, – Quentin Richardson, um, you know, so many good players yeah. that came and worked out. So they would work out with me, you know, in the, in the morning time. They'd start coming at about 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. So, like – and they would, like, from 8 to 1, these players would be coming. So you'd be on the court for literally, like, five hours. Oh and God. then you'd – and then you would, after the workouts, you would grab something to eat, come back. The players would get their basketball workout in, go upstairs. They had like this health club. It's actually, it was called Hoops to Gym. It was a basketball facility, three courts. And then Tim had this band box little weight room upstairs with all this equipment in it. But it was really small. It was literally like the size of a big restaurant bathroom. Oh. You know, it, it was small. <laughs> oh, my God. But Guys would come in, they would do a circuit of a circuit of like exercises. He would make his shake, make them shakes, do their nutrition stuff. But like, so they'd work out in basketball, go up and work out with Tim. They would grab a little lunch and come back. And then they would all play in the afternoon from like two to four. Yeah. So they would like, they would have NBA referees work the camp. I mean, work the, you know, they would actually like low level NBA refs you know, not the big time refs, but some of the refs that you would see like ref in the finals games, you would see coming through Chicago to, you know, to come through and work these games. And you'd have like 10, like 15, 20 NBA players playing pickup during the week. So, yeah. So that was, for me, that was unbelievable. And I did that for a couple of years until the NBA shut that down. They didn't let NBA personnel work for an NBA team and then have the opportunity to work out. They think it was tampering with working out NBA, uh, NBA players in the summertime. Yeah. So the rule, the rule is you needed to be able to work only with your own players. So wow. eventually I had to make the decision right before, you know, like right around 2007, about a year, year before they won the championship, Danny called me up and goes, Mike, I, I want it. I want you here, but 
you have to make a decision. Do you want to work for Tim? Or you want to work for me? And for me, I loved scouting. I love evaluation. I love being with the Celtics, but my first passion and love was working with players and um, to be able to work with, you know, work with NBA guys in the summer. Also, you know, they had about a group of 10 or 12 players that uh, college kids that were getting ready for the NBA draft every summer, you yeah. know, so like in May, June, they would have these pre-draft training sessions, you know, training camp, I guess you would call them in, in Chicago. So, you know, we would do that for about six weeks, get these guys ready for the NBA draft again, Dwayne, he had Dwayne Wade, he had Sean Livingston, Andre Iguodala, you know, uh, Channing Fry, you know, had all these guys getting ready for the draft working with Tim. So being able to do the pre-draft training in the NBA guys in July and August and September. And then, you know, then we started doing it year round and um, it sort of became my passion from that. So that's sort of where, where I went from there. That's crazy. And what's, what's Tim like? Like, I know he seems like a very intense guy. What's it like? like he, he, work he, <clears throat> he's a tough nut, not to crack, you yeah. know, he's a tough nut to crack. He is a very intense, focused individual. I'll tell you the truth a hundred percent of the time, but with Tim, you always knew where you stood. Yeah. You know, you always knew where you stood and he, he would always make time for you. He, you know, if he, if he saw that you were loyal to him, he'd do anything. And I mean, anything to help you out, That's but awesome. he, he was very, he's very educated. He knows what he's talking about. He has presence with players and he know you know, he just, he's an, an unbelievable person to work for. And, you know, like I said, he'll tell you right, right to your face. If, if you ain't doing your job, he'll tell you right to your face, you, you know, and, but if you did your work, you worked hard every day and you had his back, he'd be the, he'd be the best supporter of you that you could ever have. But the players just, again, you know, he played division one at, you know, at university of Illinois, Chicago, but it have a guy that doesn't look like he played. Yeah. You know, was in great shape, yeah. great yeah. shape, but like, to have that, these NBA players that were superstars listen to a guy who never played in the NBA the way they do and have that back and forth, that to me was I need to be like that if I want to be good, you yeah, know. Yeah. And Tim looked 12,000 times better than I do. And But, like, to have that presence of players, look them in the eye and be honest, yeah, he yeah. was the one who really taught me to do that. And, you know, it, it's sort of – it's. Yeah, I mean, Tim was by far my favorite boss of all time, and I'd, I'd, I'd take a bullet for Tim. Tim's a phenomenal phenomenal human being that helped me tenfold and always supported me. But, again, just his style, it fits my personality. And, he, you know, he's – yeah, I mean, like players, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd have a client once in a while that was mouthing off to referees and not doing it the right way and always, you know, questioning things and – he, you know, it, it cost a lot to work for, you know, to work out with Tim. Yeah. Um, it probably cost you over 10,000 a month to work out with him, you know, yeah. to get this training. And I've seen him at least once come up to a player with a check for 30 grand and give it, give, you know, you almost give him his money back and say, Hey, look, take this check. I don't want your money, you know, or rip up his, I forgot what he did. Either wrote him a check or ripped up his own check, you know, that the guy gave him, but, yeah, you know, like he he had no qualms. If you weren't doing things the right way, that the way they needed to be done, he 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 didn't care. It wasn't like you know he's not one of those guys who takes Instagram pictures or players and stuff. He, you know, he he's really serious of what he does. He's not really doing it for you know notoriety or or social media. Or well, at the time there was no social media, but he wasn't doing it like to be a celebrity trainer. He he I don't care if you played in Taiwan or you played as a max contract in the NBA, he expected you to do what he needed you to do to be successful. If not, he, he had no time for you. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's, that's so cool. And that's great that you were able to learn from him. What's the biggest thing that you found out, like working with those NBA players, what did they always, did they have specific things they want to work on? Or did you guys go through different drills? Like, was there a thing, a certain NBA players? Always uh, I think I, Tim expected you to do your homework on every player you work mm -hmm. with. So, you know, again, they didn't have, <clears throat> they didn't have YouTube back then. They didn't have, you know, the internet really didn't have what they had today, not even close. So yeah, going into every player that we worked with, 
you know, I, I'm one of those basketball nuts that sort of watched every game you could and, and got every little detail of information you could. But also I had an extensive DVD collection of games, you know, when I was working for the Celtics. So yeah. um, if we if we were saying, hey, look, we're going to bring in, you know, we're going to bring in Tracy McGrady. I need you to, you know, I need you to, you to do as much homework as you can on him. And I want you not only to work on the things that he's not great at, but some of the things he might just have to add to be even better. Now, it wasn't. Tracy but like that's just an example yeah but you know so for, for some players that were still transitioning and developing in the first four or five years of their career mm-hmm. you would sort of dictate the things that I think they needed to work on as well as the stuff that he they they said hey I need to get better at x y or z yeah the players like a Jawan Howard or Michael Finley or you know or at the time and guys like that that were veterans that sort of knew what they were doing and, and sort of been through it six or seven years already. Yeah. Uh, they would just sort of, it's more of a tune up, you know, yeah. coming in, get shots up, get moving, maybe add something, but you, you weren't adding anything to them. Those guys are very, even though they, they were great guys, they were very intimidating to work out at first, you know, and just because they had presence and they, they were already, they were already big time players in the league. I'm never intimidated in working with somebody, but there was, like, again, they don't know you and you have to sort of develop that trust with them. Yeah. They were a little intimidating at first. So just sort of going with the flow, making small tweaks if you saw them, but like sort of just going through a workout to get a move in shots that you knew that they shot in games. Those that's more like if you're going to work out a vet, that's that's probably what you would do. Even a young Dwayne Wade. Working out with him on his post game on some of the things that he could do in the post, some of the things that MJ would do in the post or even Kobe would do in the post. And then you would bring it to their game, you know, teaching him some things in the post that he never did before. Like those are the things you would do even for a great young player that you would try to add to me after like five or six years in the NBA, it's more like maintenance. You know, the shots you're going to get in games, you might want to add a thing or two, but for the most part, it's just all about your routine and keeping it, as sort of disciplined and sort of consistent as possible. That's that's awesome. That's really cool, and that's 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 great. Oh man, that's and that didn't help you like hook you up with uh, Kobe Bryant. Yeah. So funny story with that. 